I want to present something that's very much a work in progress and, and thank Kevin once again for giving me the opportunity to work on this work in progress. Um, I just, by way of introduction, the Alexander Romance is, is a complex and, and remarkable text. Um, problematic in many ways. Uh, I was recently at a conference and uh, I was asked, so when, you know, when you talk about the composition of the, uh, the romance, when do you mean? And, and I had to, to look in the face, the, the two people who are uh, the two very different datings of the Alexander Romance. Uh, Richard Stoneman, who says it's m more or less a Ptolemaic work, uh, and uh, Corinne Jeunot, who says it's more or less a very late antique work. Uh, and they're both right. Uh, and that was, of course, the answer I came off with at the conference. Uh, however, you know, it, that, that's a stretch of about six or seven hundred years. But the, the, um, the romance is in a ferment of composition throughout this period. And afterward, uh, we, don't, we don't have an established text by the end of late antiquity. We end up having several recensions, different, different versions that uh, are, are so different. They're, they're not merely manuscript variations. They are indeed uh, distinct texts in their own way. At any rate, I want to concentrate on one episode in which Alexander, uh, a fabulous legendary Alexander, goes to the, port, the, the court of the Persian king Darius in disguise as his own ambassador. He's been warned in a dream uh, by, by the god Ammon, who may or may not be his father, that he had better go himself, otherwise he'll be betrayed by the ambassador he sends. And he, he indicates a special costume for him to wear. He says, go dressed as the god Hermes. And so Alexander does. He goes as his own, as his own ambassador. And uh, he is, not surprisingly, a little bit lippy with the Persian king. The Persian king remarks on this. But, but more to the point, uh, he's invited to dine with the, the Persian nobles. And as the, the banquet progresses, he starts pocketing the golden goblets his drinks are served in. And he does it quite ostentatiously, and the, the, uh, the Persian nobles there remark on this. They, they ask him, what are you doing? And he says, oh, well, I thought this was what was done. This is how Alexander entertains. At his banquets, you get to walk away with the gold that's, that's the service, right? And um, then at a certain point, you know, and this, this causes a stir, but then at a certain point, an individual who had been an ambassador to, to Philip's court, to the Macedonian court, recognizes Alexander and, and points out to Darius who he is. But the, the Persians are so drunk by this point, Alexander overhears this and he manages to escape. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thrilling nighttime horseback chase. He, he just makes it across a frozen river. His horse doesn't. Uh, and, and that's the end of the story. It's, it's great stuff. Uh, but there's there's a lot at work here. Now, not surprisingly, one of the first things to recognize about this is that it's entirely fictional. There are portions of the Alexander romance that are closely based on the historical record. Uh, and this is, this is one of the, the interesting topics in, in Alexander romance studies, is how, how close are we to, to the historical record? Can we find historical material in this essentially fabulous and legendary text? Uh, but this, this one is, is fictional. But that, that's also interesting, because then it's, it's a composition of, of some later period, and it's, it's inserted into the record of Alexander. Um, it's not derived from a reliable record. It's, it's made up around the character of Alexander. Also, um, it, is, it is interesting that it is one of the few instances of characterization. Characterization is rather rare. We, we see a lot of, of what Alexander does in the Alexander romance, but we're never told what kind of person he is. And then remarkably, the person who tells us what kind of person Alexander is, is Alexander himself. 
and we're not sure whether or not we should rely on it because he's telling his enemies what kind of person he is. All right, so there, there's a complexity to this episode. I want to try to unpackage it in a number of ways. Um, Kevin, still 20 minutes or so? Oh, you're good. Okay, okay. Now, I think one of the, the things that makes this significant within the context of of the Alexander Romance is what the Alexander Romance doesn't say, doesn't contain. Because there are a number of significant episodes of banqueting in the historical record of Alexander that are neglected or minimalized in the Alexander Romance. Now, I, I went through, I tried to come up with a list of these, but I, and I won't, I won't go through each of them. But I would I'd suggest to you that um, you know, the, the, the general impression is that banqueting is quite rare in the Alexander Romance. And certainly, um, you know, I was talking to, to someone, um, the, the, trans, the Polish translator of the Alexander Romance, and he said there were only two instances of feasting. Uh, there was this one, and the feast at which Alexander is poisoned. He missed a number of them. These are probably the most prominent, but um, I think also, he, he is really intent on finding the historical in, in the legendary accounts of Alexander. So he, he neglects these fictionalized ones. Um, but, but one of the things is that in the historical record, the banquets, the instances of feasting, are often occasions for the drunken outrages of Alexander. Uh, and, and this is an important aspect of the character of Alexander. Um, in 1992, John Maxwell O'Brien wrote a book, Alexander the Great, The Invisible Enemy, which essentially talked about Alexander the Alcoholic. Uh, discussed how alcohol impaired Alexander's decisions, um, led to a deterioration of his leadership, so on and so forth. It, um, uh, the, the presentation of Alexander on the model of Dionysus or, or someone destroyed by Dionysus, so Pentheus. Fa it's a fascinating book um, and, it, and it, it underlines an important aspect of the presentation of Alexander in the historical record. No less than um, one of the appendices to what is probably one of the best books on Alexander in the last 10 or 15 years, From Alexander to Jesus by Ori Amitai, uh, 2010. Appendix C is entitled Alexander Alcoholicus, and it, it, it points out all those instances where Alexander and his friends are depicted as drunks, and it's, it's not a short appendix. Uh, it, it, and all it does is point out the primary sources. But this is an aspect of Alexander that the, the romance denies. We do not see an alcoholic Alexander. Uh, the, the essential consensus of the historical record is that Alexander drinks himself to death. Right? He, he dies, perhaps not of alcohol poisoning, but what, what hastens his death is, is the heroic consumption of wine. Um, heroic in a very, very negative sense of the word. In the romance, it, the point is made repeatedly, he was poisoned. He, he, did not, um, he did not succumb to alcohol poisoning. It was not overindulgence, it was poisoning. Um, so one of the reasons the historical record of banqueting is, is shunted to one side is because it presents the wrong Alexander, not the Alexander that, that um, the, the romance wants. It's not that the romance is unwilling to entertain a negative depiction of Alexander, but he's hubristic rather than alcoholic. Right? Now, there are at least three episodes, incidents from the, the historical record, that are remarkable for being absent, but I would suggest also replaced by this, this episode of Alexander going in disguise to the Persian court. Because they, they deal with banqueting as a context for Alexander's uh, self-presentation, to the Persians, his interactions with the Persians, and they trace a development in those interactions. Uh, those three would be, first of all, the, the, the drunken carousal that ends in the burning of the palace 
of the Persian kings at Persepolis, right? Uh, and it's, it's emphasized that this probably wouldn't have happened if Alexander hadn't been drunk, right? So his first presentation as a destroyer to the Persians is in the context of, of banqueting, feasting, but always feasting with wine. The Macedonian way, if you will. Then again, the proskunesis affair, right? The, the attempt by Alexander and some of his advisors, both Greek and Persian, to introduce the Persian custom of, of uh, and we're not precisely sure what is intended, but bowing before the king, right? making obeisance before the king, takes place in the context of a banquet. And in fact, the, the banqueting context is very important. Right? Uh, it's, it's part of this commensural event. Uh, and, it, and it draws a definite distinction between the Greeks and the Persians, but it's also a point of self-presentation by Alexander to the Persians. He's trying to make himself, rather than the destroyer of the legacy of the Persian kings, their successor. And finally, the banquet at Opus is perhaps the most important instances, instance of these banquets, these, these feasting events. Uh, there, the, the, the feast celebrates the marriage of Alexander to one of the daughters of Darius, the, the dead Persian king, and the, the marriages of a number of his soldiers, some of them very highly placed, to Persian women. And it is supposed to uh, celebrate or inaugurate a union of the Greek and Persian peoples. And obviously this is intended for Persian consumption, it's a, an event that is noxious to many of the Macedonian veterans. Right? So remarkable. None of these events occur in the Alexander Romance. Right? Rather, we have this, this amongst the most important encounters. But um, we can't suggest that the neglect of these incidents, along with the other instances of, of feasting, is due to ignorance. Since the Alexander Romance offers its own version of the marriage feast of Philip and Cleopatra, so Alexander's father to a Macedonian princess, uh, in a way in opposition to his marriage to Alexander's mother, Olympias. Now, th the account in the Alexander Romance is reasonably close to that in, for instance, Plutarch, but it is marked by the Alexander Romance's characteristic slips. Right. The, the opponent, the antagonist, is Lysias, the brother of Cleopatra in the romance, whereas in Plutarch it's Attalus, her uncle. And exaggeration. Um, in Plutarch, Alexander throws a wine cup at Attalus uh, and offends him. In the romance, Alexander throws a wine cup at Lysias and kills him. I, I'm not sure exactly what would be necessary to, to manage that, but you can do it in the romance, right? In legend, it's possible. But note, a wine cup is prominent in this banqueting episode. And this account, which, which has, has such close um, parallels to the historical record, is an occasion for mythological illusion which is actually rather rare in the Alexander Romance. Here there are explicit references to famous banquet battles, right? The, the centaurs and the lapiths, Odysseus and the suitors, right? This is interesting because the incident in the Alexander Romance is itself um, an intertextual event. Now, the references in, in the story of, of the marriage feast of Philip and Cleopatra are explicit. Those in the, um, the episode of Alexander going in disguise as his own messenger, they're implicit, but I think they're, they're just as strong. For example, now I, I think they're, they're essentially Homeric, or especially Homeric. Um, Hermes appears to Alexander in a dream in order to inaugurate this event. And he tells him to go, pardon me, Ammon. Ammon appears to Alexander and he tells him to go 
dressed as Hermes. He tells him to go to, to the heart of enemy territory where he's entertained in a meal as Hermes. And this recalls Book 24 of the Iliad, where Hermes conducts Priam to the very heart of, of the enemy camp, right? to, the, to the, the booth of Achilles, where he is entertained with a meal. Uh, Kevin might have a few things to say about that. But this is not the end of the, the Homeric illusion. Uh, Odysseus frequently tells lies to hide his identity. But in Book 14 of the Odyssey, he also, while disguised as a beggar, tells a story about himself that is about Odysseus. I mean, he, he, as the beggar, he has said he's a veteran of the Trojan War. And, and it's a cold night, a cold and rainy night. Um, but the beggar, Odysseus, does not have a cloak. He wants one. So he says, oh, you know, if only people respected me as, as when I was a great warrior. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about me and Odysseus. I went out on a night ambush with Odysseus and I didn't have a cloak, but it started to snow. I was going to freeze to death. And I told Odysseus. Now, Odysseus does not depict himself as generous. Rather, not surprisingly, he depicts himself as cunning. Odysseus says to the beggar, that is, Odysseus tells this story about himself saying to, to the man who had become the beggar, don't tell anybody else. He says, I need a messenger to go back to the camp. Who'll go? And a runner goes off and he says, there's your cloak, my friend. All right, so by cunning, Odysseus manages to get the advantage he wants, not from an enemy, but from, from a friend. I mean, not surprising. This, this is Odysseus after all. But Odysseus is telling a story about himself in the third person. I, I, I think this is, this is remarkable. I think this is the context in which we have to read this episode. But it's not the only one. In another story within the, the Odyssey, uh, Eumaeus's story of himself. So the audience of this story in Book 14, Eumaeus the swineherd, he tells the beggar Odysseus about his own background. And he was kidnapped by, he was, he was a prince, he was kidnapped by a Phoenician maid who, who took him on board a Phoenician ship that sailed off with him. But the, the royal heir is not the only thing the Phoenician maid steals. She also steals three goblets from the residue of a feast. Now, the, the goblets might, might seem, well, of course, no goblets, easy to, easy to pocket. But I think there's more to it. I mean, she doesn't just steal the goblets. She steals the posterity of the house. And this is what Alexander will end up doing as well. Alexander takes over the empire of Darius, and eventually he will marry one of, Ale uh, of Darius' daughters. He takes over the posterity of the house. Right? And, of course, when you see Phoenician kidnappers, you're bound to recall the preface to Herodotus' histories, which, which sees uh, at least one instance of Phoenician kidnapping as a prelude to the, um, this, the well, part of this tit-for-tat kidnapping, the prelude to inveterate uh, enmity between Europe and Asia, which Alexander's career, I mean, you can either see it as a conclusion to that enmity, or you can see it as uh, another incident in it. But you know, they, there's, there's a lot of intertextuality going on here. Fascinating stuff. However, and, and this is important, especially in a text like the, the Romance, where you, you can get the impression that what you're looking at are bits and pieces that have been arbitrarily joined together. But this incident is remarkably well integrated with the work as a whole. Um, First of all, it is a number, uh, is one of a number of prominent episodes involving emissaries or ambassadors. I'll, I'll come back to that. But uh, Alexander's ambassadors go to Tyre. Uh, he's been warned not to go in disguise as his own ambassador to Tyre, right? once again in a divine vision. So what happens at Tyre, which is, is based on the historical record, indicates the danger he undertakes on his visit to the Persian court. But this 
This incident is also strongly anticipated by Alexander's reception of Darius's messengers. Uh, first of all, there's the threat of death, right, which, which is repealed by Alexander. Then there is dining. Alexander receives Darius's, uh, Darius's ambassadors. He feeds them. There's an opportunity for treachery. Right? Uh, Ammon has warned Alexander not to go because he'll be betrayed by his messenger. The messengers of Darius attempt to betray their king. And, and Alexander refuses their help. He says, if you're willing to betray your king, how can I trust you? But it's an, it's an opportunity for treachery. Also, it's an opportunity for Alexander's self-presentation, self-promotion, if you will. Right? He gives gifts to the ambassador. Now, as his own ambassador, he takes gifts. But he gives gifts to Darius's ambassador, and he leaves them with a good impression of himself, essentially as a gift giver which is the, the impression he wants to, to leave by taking the goblets at the, at the feast. The integration is further seen in that Alexander is recognized by one of Darius's ambassadors to the court of Philip, or an individual who had been. Right? Now, in the text as we have it, this is not connected as closely as, it, as I think it, it ought to have been or, or was at one point. But um, Alexander must have been recognized by means of a portrait that all of the versions tell us the, um, the Persian ambassadors had secretly painted of Alexander. Right? So they go off with a, with a portrait of Alexander and then I think this is how the ambassador is supposed to recognize him because this is the very device that is later used by the Ethiopian queen Kandake to recognize Alexander when he visits Ethiopia in disguise as one of his own agents. Right, so, but the, of, of all the, the episodes, of all the scenes in, in the romance, this is one of the best integrated. It, it fits into the whole. Um, also, there, there are at least two more episodes of Alexander going in disguise as his own messenger. This is completely unhistorical, but in the romance it becomes a habit. Right? Um, now, there are other prominent banqueting episodes in the Alexander romance. Uh, first of all, in, in the romance, Philip is not really the father of Alexander, though he's all, he often is. It's, it's a confusing matter, right? because I think we're, we're looking at a number of sources and a number of layers to this. But Olympias is impregnated by the exiled Egyptian king, or the refugee Egyptian king, Nectanebo, who, who takes on the semblance of the god Ammon. Uh, and, but it's unclear if Ammon has impregnated Olympias or if Nectanebo has. I mean, Nectanebo has literally, but perhaps as a manifestation of Ammon. But, so, um, but of course, Philip is a bit suspicious because, because his wife conceives when he's off on campaign. So, in, in the same way that Nectanebo uses magic to seduce Olympias, he uses magic to alleviate the suspicions of Philip in the context of a banquet. He appears in the form of an eagle and a lion in order to let Philip know that his wife has been impregnated by a god. Right? Uh, I would, I would suggest, in addition to being a possible divine manifestation in the context of banqueting, this is also an intercultural or a political encounter. Right? Because one of the things it does is, I mean, one of the things Olympias being impregnated by Nectanebo does is make Alexander the legitimate king of Egypt. And, and this, this text, or at least parts of it, are a Ptolemaic composition. And they legitimate the rule of the Ptolemies. Um, so, I think this is important from that, that angle. I've already mentioned um, Alexander is poisoned by his companions, by his friends, at a dinner. Right. Um, but, but there are more significant episodes, or, or at least there are further very significant episodes of banqueting. Um, on his deathbed, Alexander expects that his mother Olympias will be, will be grief-stricken by his death. So he orders her to hold a banquet, but tells her she can only invite 
those who have known no sorrow. Of course, this is, this is departing wisdom on the, the part of Alexander because nobody comes. No, nobody can accept this invitation. Right? So, Olympias, be comforted, you're not alone. Right? Um, it's remarkable. Also, in, in a slightly later, um, and, and a version that's beginning to be Christianized, right? a slightly later version around 500 AD, these instances, these significant instances of banqueting attract to the Alexander romance a story of Alexander's army taking vessels from a temple of an unnamed god. Now the god is unnamed. The god is, is manifestly and bodily present in the temple as a recumbent figure under, under a shroud. But the, the art, the iconography uh, of Maenads and Bacchants and uh, uh, satyrs and old man Maron indicates this might very well be Dionysus. However, when the vessels are taken out of the temple and Alexander's army go to use them in feasting, the, the manifestations of divine wrath are decidedly biblical. Right? Uh, first of all, the, the mountain smokes as, as if it's struck by lightning. And, and of course, what angers the deity is, is the use of his sacred vessels in a sacrilegious fashion. So it recalls both the Israelites at Mount Sinai uh, before Moses comes down and, and sorts things out and the Feast of Belshazzar. Uh, but, but of course the God seems to be Dionysus. It's, it's a very strange passage, fascinating passage. And I think if, if we didn't have all these instances of banqueting, uh, it, it would never have found its place in the Alexander Romance. So to end, I'd like to suggest that this episode of Alexander going in disguise as his own ambassador, his own messenger, and then um, all of these, these things taking place in the context of banqueting are, are important for at least two reasons. First of all, it underscores banqueting as the setting for discussions and exempla of the proper treatment of emissaries. Now, I, I mean, really, we'd, we'd like to know when these episodes enter the Romance tradition to try to find some kind of political or social context for them. But of course, we've got that six or seven hundred year window that we have to deal with. But certainly, this is an example of a formalized encounter between cultures and between political powers. It is about commensural diplomacy, the, the role of eating and feasting in diplomacy. Also, and, and this is, uh, I suppose, in, in the context of uh, literary history and, and the, the creation of the personality of Alexander by the sources about him, this, as I mentioned, is, is practically the only example of Alexander engaging in conscious and intentional self-presentation in a work in which characterization is rare. And then when we have the instance, it is layered, it is ambiguous, it is complex. Um, we have so many questions. Alexander says this happens at, at his feasts, but we, we have no passage in the, the romance that suggests it ever did. Is Alexander lying to the Persians? Is this something that the author has neglected to say? You know, it's, it's not a complete, it's not, a, it's not as... as um, uh, worked out or, or it has not survived as completely as we'd like. So it leaves us with a number of questions. But, but it's, um, it's fascinating because of course he's, he's talking about himself in the third person. Um, what, what does he want the reader to believe? What does he want his audience to believe? Um, yeah, uh, as I say, I think uh, remarkable on a number of, of counts, but those two especially. So. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.